verse 6. This is the word of God. If you point out these things, let me start over again. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. I have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And that is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. <clears throat> Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So far the reading of God's Word. In verse 6, Paul starts um, by reminding Timothy that these are things that should be obvious in the life of a good minister of Christ Jesus. And I remind you that that minister can also mean servant of Christ Jesus. Meaning, in this case, he is writing it to Timothy, the pastor of the church in Ephesus. So what we have here is very important for every pastor and elder to take note of. Um, but also, in a very general sense, every believer who is a servant of our Lord Christ Jesus, should take note of these things. Now what have we learned so far about a good minister of Christ Jesus? Here are the summary of what we have so far. In verse 6, that first part of verse 6, a good minister of Christ will point out error. The second part of verse 6, he will be, or she, if it is, a lady, she will be well fit on scripture. He will be well nourished in scripture. Verse 7, the first part, he will stay away from unbiblical teachings. The second part of verse 7, focus on training to be godly, to be more Christ-like. When we come to verse 10, he will labor and strive for the gospel's sake. Verse 12, he will be exemplary in speech and in conduct and life, faith and purity. Verse 13, he will be devoted to the reading, teaching and preaching of scripture. Verse 14, he will not neglect the gift of the ministry of the word. And tonight, we add the last personal quality of a good minister of Christ, which is to be diligent in these matters. Verses 15 and 16. Timothy, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your, your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So the first thing that we as um, ministers of Christ, whether that is pastor or believer in general, should take note of is that we should be diligent in these matters. Now we will take that phrase apart as we go along, but let's just start off with those first two words. Be diligent. What does that mean? The New English Bible puts it like this. Make these matters your business. A good translation would be practice this. Continually practice these things. Paul was reminding Timothy here to practice these things that he has mentioned that I've just summarized for you and not slack down. This is a call to diligent sweat, one part, as one pastor put it. And the underlying is the idea is that of a constant 
heartfelt concern and the keeping up of the practices that a good minister of Christ Jesus should focus on. And that phrase, give yourself wholly to them, underscores the seriousness and the intensity of that diligence. Give yourself wholly to them, literally would read like this, be in these things. Be consumed by these things. Be absorbed in them. Jesus' intensity regarding his ministry comes to mind when we remember that day that he cleared the temple from those who made money from the sacrificial system. What did his disciples say? John 2 verse 17. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume you. That's the idea here. In Timothy's context, that meant to be consumed by the zeal for preaching and teaching God's word. And Paul called Timothy, Timothy to know more than what he expected of every believer. In Romans 12 he wrote, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord in these things. Now what are these things? If you go back to verse 11 of chapter 4, um, Paul clearly writes, Command and teach these things. What are these things? Well, logically, it refers to all the things that he set up to that point, and directly what, will, what follows um, that point, meaning Timothy had to command and teach, and in our case here in verse 15, be diligent in this. What? He had to give his whole life to the things that Paul mentioned, to fight biblical error, to nourish himself with scripture knowledge, to train in godliness, to strive for the gospel, to be an example, to be devoted to the reading and the preaching and the teaching of God's word and to the exercising of his gift in this regard. These are the things he had to be diligent in. And, and these matters mentioned here had to become like second nature to him. And this should be true for every minister of Christ Jesus, whether pastor or member. We should give our whole life to these things. To stand up against biblical error. To nourish ourselves in the scripture. To train in godliness. To strive for the gospel. To be an example of Jesus Christ. To be devoted to the word. And to exercise our gifts in the local church that the Lord has given us. Timothy had to be diligent in these things. And here's something interesting that he wrote, that Paul wrote to him. So that everyone may see your progress. Progress meaning, uh, the, uh, referring to growth, refer, referring to forward movement, referring to advancement. Why would Paul say that? Because he reminded Timothy here that the local church had to see his growth, his forward movement, his advancement, his progress. Because these are signs of spiritual life and ministry effectiveness. And Paul wanted Timothy to exhibit both. Why would he want Timothy to exhibit progress so that the rest of the congregation could see that? Well, earlier in this letter, Paul wrote to Timothy that he had to set an example. Remember that? Chapter 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And he mentioned this setting of an example, as this verse begins, verse 12, in the context of some who were looking down on Timothy because of his young age. And he's reminding Timothy to set an example in the things that matter. Set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity. Let the people see that. Let them see that and be convinced that being a minister of Christ Jesus is not about your biological age. 
but your spiritual maturity and your giftedness. And here in verse 15, Paul brings the eyes of the church back into his letter again. So that everyone may see your progress. Timothy, be diligent in these things so that people may see that. Sort of to say, Timothy, don't give them a stone to throw you with. Be diligent in these things, in the, in the preaching and the teaching of the word, so that people can see your heart, your commitment, your growth as a minister of Christ Jesus. And see that the eyes of the church members are always scrutinizing the life of a pastor, Timothy. So let them see what matters. Let them see progress in all these things that I've mentioned. From biblical error to training in godliness to re uh, reading, preaching and teaching the word and exercising his gift. Let that be what convinced them that you are the mature minister of God. That he wants there in Ephesus. Another thing that Paul then reminds Timothy of in verse 16 is if... Being a good minister of Christ Jesus, <clears throat> be also diligent in watching your life and your doctrine closely. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Watch your life refers to the example of godliness, commanded in verse 12 that I've just read, speech, life, love, faith and purity. Watch your doctrine references his preaching and teaching in verse 13. But here in verse 16, the teacher and his teaching are intimately linked. Paul reminds Timothy to give attention to his life, to give attention to himself, to keep a strict eye on his speech and actions and love and faith and purity. To watch his life. Meaning, Timothy, you must constantly examine your heart, your mind, your actions, your desires, your feelings, your soul, your whole life. Make sure that it is on track. On, to make sure that his observable life, that what people can see, is still in step with his salvation in Christ Jesus. And with what he preach, what he preaches and teaches. Now some ladies in Ephesus did not watch their lives in this matter. We have a practical example of this. Going haywire, going wrong. Um, they dressed immodestly, you can read of that in chapter 2 from verse 9 and up to verse 10. They dressed immodestly, they dressed indecently, adorning themselves elaborately to show off their wealth in church. And Paul had to point out that they should adorn themselves, verse 9, verse 10, with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship. God. Good deeds. That's the life part. That's what should be seen. And worshipping God. That's the doctrine part. It has to be in sync. Both of them has to complement the other. The, this should be applied not just for those ladies in their church life, but it should apply in family life, in our work life, in our friendships. We, we can say something like, um, if we read that verse, let my work be filled with good deeds, appropriate for a man or a woman who profess to worship God. Let my friendships be filled with good deeds, appropriate for a man or a woman who profess to worship God. Can, you see what I mean? How doctrine and life should go together, how they are linked how both should be there and given attention to. This watching of life is mentioned with regards to the spiritual well-being of Timothy, but also of his hearers there in the end of, at the end of verse 16. Watch your life in doctrine closely, persevere in them, because if you do, 
you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now we will get to the detail of that, but it, it simply means this for now. Timothy, or oh, you pastor, you good minister of Jesus Christ, you believer, if you do not live an exemplary life in Christ, do not expect the flock to stay spiritually healthy and safe. Your hearers will see that. They will pick it up. So watch your life and watch your doctrine all the time. And yes, it goes for what we believe as well. It goes for our doctrine or doctrines as well. Timothy had to make sure that he's faithful in the teaching and preaching of the word of God alone. With an emphasis on that word alone because these other guys who were there that he refers to as uh, false teachers, they added things, as I've said earlier on, to the gospel of Christ Jesus. The preaching and teaching of the word of God alone, he had to be diligent in sticking to the doctrines of the faith as he had received it from Paul. Timothy must watch that he does not step off that path of pure doctrine. Imagine a road that you have to walk on. Or a train that is on the rails. He should not step off that. Those two rails or that path representing pure doctrine. The moment you step off that pure doctrine, you will land in a swamp of myths or speculations or mysticism. Anything but the truth. Make sure that you stay within the boundaries on that road, on those two rails that is the pure doctrine that Paul had received from Christ and that he passed on to Timothy. So, he had to watch that Timothy, his life and his doctrine closely. Keep these two in sync with his confession of Christ alone and the doctrines of the gospel of Christ. His walk and his talk must both reflect salvation in Christ alone, by faith alone, the Christ-centered gospel doctrines and a commitment to these truths that he had received from Paul. Persevere in them, Paul says. Don't take one step to the side. Don't try out new things on the side that are unbiblical. Or programs that are built on psychology. Stick to the pure doctrine. Watch your doctrine. Make sure that it aligns with the truth of Scripture all the time. And persevere in it. Now, remember, although Paul writes this to Timothy, it applies to you and me as believers every day of our lives. We must walk our talk spiritually speaking, and keep on doing that. Persevere in them, Paul writes. St remain steady in both, Timothy. In, in other letters, um, Paul used the Greek word for that persevere as follows. And I'm going to give you a few. Um, shall we continue in sins? That word continue is the same as persevere that he uses here. If they do not persist in unbelief, that persist part is the same as persevere in Greek that we have here. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. That word remain as the same word as persevere that, we've, that we read of here in, in verse 16. If you continue in your faith, all these words tell us the sense of... Of a sense of understanding that, that Paul had in mind with the word persevere, meaning remain in them, continue in them, do not step to the left, do not step to the right, remain in the doctrines of Christ alone. That is what a good minister of Christ Jesus should do. Continue in what you have learned, Timothy. Continue to persist in godliness. 
remain in the Word of God. Continue preaching and teaching the Word of God alone. Be established in it in every aspect of your life and ministry. And do not move from the doctrines of the Word. This is the path, the road, the rails that a good minister of Christ should stay on with regards to his doctrine. So watch it that you stay there. Do not go to a siding. Do not step off to follow a big billboard of some advertise of an advertisement of some experience that will bring you closer to God. Stick to the word. Oh. This balance of life and doctrine is so important for us. And for the minister of Christ Jesus, pastor or a member of a church, every believer. Doctrine, what we believe, has everything to do with life. Because what we believe about God determines how we live. The more we know about God and His workings, the more we will love Him. And the better we will serve Him. That's how those two go together. On the other hand, godly lifestyle has everything to do with maintaining doctrine. Because if we do not live according to what we know of God and His Word, we will either disbelieve or we will attempt to change His Word. Which was what those false teachers in Ephesus did. Their life and doctrine were totally out of sync with one another. It led them to disconnect with the Gospel of Christ. That's what will happen. Imagine the train on the rails. If you take one rail away, that train will derail. Your life and doctrine should be in sync with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, for the glory of God alone. These guys disconnected from that. And their preaching became unsound and their faith became shipwrecked it led to the point where two of them had to be handed to satan to to, to taught, be taught not to blaspheme that meant to put them out of church and the, the blessings and the protection of the church it led to ungodly teachings as paul um, reminded timothy later in chapter six and this was what happened with many Ephesians who got their doctrine, what they believe, and their life, how they live, out of step with one another, out of step with the gospel. They wanted to stand with their one foot in the Jewish law and myths and the other foot in the gospel. And you cannot do that. That would t be to take a, 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 the two rails of, of a train and to start to split them like this. The train will derail. They wanted to do that. If the one goes off beat, life or doctrine, the other will also sound a false note. If one of the band members here sing falsely, it will sound as if the whole band is singing falsely. So watch your life and your doctrine and make sure that they are in sync with the gospel of Christ Jesus. And Timothy and believer, persevere in that. Watch it. Ask yourself, what am I like at church? What am I like at home? What am I like at work? How, how are my actions complementing that which I confess with my mouth? To be a Christian? To belong to Jesus Christ? Uh, is my confession and my action in line with my, one another? How is my speech? How is my love, my faith, my purity? Can people observe from that that I do belong to Jesus Christ? How is my doctrine? What do you believe? Is it truly biblical? Or is it so mixed up with worldly ideas and so synchronized with, with worldly philosophies? Like 
what happened in, in Ephesus, but in today's world with whatever um, Instagram bring, brings us, many ungodly things on YouTube and TikTok. Oh, we can even go one step further. We hold so on to our culture that that became part of the gospel. Or simply, I have my own views about these things, whether they are biblical or not. Your own views then become your gospel. No. Watch your life and your doctrine. And by your doctrine, not what you have made up in your mind, but the doctrine as it has been given to us in God's word. Watch them. Make sure that they are aligned. Make sure that they go together. Make sure that they are in sync and in step with one another and with the gospel of Christ. Not like those false teachers in Ephesus who got it out of sync and shipwrecked their faith. Not like those ladies in Ephesus who thought they can have one foot in both worlds of one of wealth and showing off their wealth and the other one to say that uh, uh, they belong to Jesus Christ and they had no works in the end. To confirm their confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Just the opposite. Do I live what I believe? Now, this is all so important for ministry. Yes, as a pastor, as a believer, pastors, good ministers of Christ, as Paul put it there in verse 6, should persevere in these things, should set an example in these things. And then we're back to that last phrase that I referred to earlier on, that Paul wrote to Timothy. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. That's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Because obviously we know a pastor can save no one. You cannot save anyone. Salvation is a sovereign work of grace from God, by God, to the glory of the triune God. So how shall we understand this? Well, some have tried to handle this difficulty by saying that the word save means something besides salvation from sin and death. Let me explain. This, this is a possible interpretation of this last phrase here. Because the Greek word for salvation, which is sozo, was often used to mean something like safekeeping as well. So, in, in this interpretation, Timothy's persistence in personal godliness and the faithful teaching of God's word will preserve both himself and his congregation from spiritual harm. And it makes absolutely sense in that context. With some of those false teachers did not do that. And they suffered spiritual harm. They dislocated from the gospel. And all weird things started to happen in the church. They, f- they fought with one another. They debated with one another. All but the love of Christ was seen in many of those instances. Wealth became a big thing there. Paul had to address it twice in this letter. One with regards to the ladies and then in chapter 6 as well. Everything got out of sync because of that. Spiritual harm followed. So in that sense, this, it, it makes absolutely sense that Paul could say a thing like, Persevere in these things, because that way you can keep yourself and your hearers safe from spiritual harm. However, it's also possible that Paul was thinking of salvation in the gospel sense of the word. What this verse then acknowledges is that ministers of the gospel have a crucial role in the salvation of believers. And here is how. Salvation, we know, comes by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. But Romans 10 verse 17 reminds us, faith comes from hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, the word of Christ 
comes to the sinner through the preaching to the hearer, through preaching of the gospel of Christ Jesus. And in that sense, the bringer of the good news can be said to save his hearers. Paul explains this, he uses this kind, of, this kind of talk in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. Um, if you want to go there, you're welcome. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. And this is what he, what he wrote, just to, to show you what he, what he means here. One Corinthians nine verse twenty two to the weak I became weak to win the weak I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Now does this mean he can save people? That he is their savior? That he that his merit, merits or actions can actually save sinners? No. What he means is this, that through the heralding of the gospel, through the proclamation of Jesus Christ, he was just the means in God's sovereign hand to save lost souls. In that sense, he can say a thing like, you will save both yourself and your hearers. John Calvin, the great reformer, comments on this, that although salvation is God's gift alone, we know that, Yet human ministry has an important place in the way God works, as is implied here by Paul. I remember one young man uh, telling me, this is a young man um, coming to the YP and he, uh, now for a year or two, and he's, nearly every Sunday morning he's here with us. Um, and when we spoke about salvation, um, I asked him afterwards, you know, uh, where do you stand with regards to the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ? And he said, I think I'm saved. I said, why? He said, because Pastor Kali spoke about this and this and this and this. It was one of those messages, uh, um, Pastor Kali in Hebrews. And that convinced me, that convicted me. Now, we can say in that sense, Pastor Kali has saved this young man. But it didn't, doesn't mean he saved the man, but what he preached. What he brought from the word of God to that man's heart. And the Holy Spirit applied that in that young man's heart. So that he was waken up from his dead condition in sin. And given life so that he could respond to Jesus Christ. And say, yes, you are my Lord. Please save me. Why was this so important for Timothy to hear? And, and with regards to us, why is this important to hear? Why is this important for a pastor to hear? That the Lord uses the preaching, your life, your doctrine to save the lost. To keep the congregation safe. And both these meanings have a foot to stand on, we have seen. Why is this so important? Well, for Timothy, that would have meant a big motivation to keep on, to be diligent, to watch, to persevere in these things. It would not be an exercise in vain to do that, in other words. It would have motivated Timothy, knowing that the Lord uses the message that he brings, the pure doctrine that he teaches, the life that he lives in being an example of Jesus Christ to the congregation, that the Lord uses that to save the lost. So for Timothy, that meant he could continue to be diligent in his example of Christ, to keep on being a devoted minister to the word of the Lord and not slack down, to keep on persevering in bringing the gospel, even though it was very difficult in Ephesus, although they, even though they, there were a lot of opposition in Ephesus, false teachers, people having wrong ideas about womanhood, manhood, leadership in the church, how to treat the poor, how to, what to do with your wealth, and all these things, 
to be devoted to that and keep on persevering in that and keep on bringing the gospel of Christ Jesus to those sinners because he now knew and it was confirmed in the words of Paul, his mentor, that the Lord uses those things to save sinners. And that is how God also uses our witness and our testimony sometimes and our bringing of the word and our preaching and our lives to save the lost. So, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you Lord for your amazing grace. Thank you Lord that we have these words from Paul and um, words that were written to Timothy, but words that came from you that were given to our brother Paul to wrote to Pastor Timothy. And in that, Lord, we, our hearts are challenged. Our hearts are challenged uh, by, by acknowledging that we are not always as diligent in these things, in these matters as we should be. That, that we are sometimes only giving ourselves halfway to it and that we are not wholly absorbed in them. And that sometimes, Lord, when people look at us and our lives and our doctrines, they, they, they might not see any progress. Oh, Lord, please change that. Please stir our hearts. Please move us to obey your words and listen to your word and be taught your word and help us to stay on that path of pure doctrine and the life that is pure in your sight. Help us to watch our lives and doctrine. Help us to persevere in that, Lord. Because now we know that you use all of that to bring life, to bring the message of life in Jesus Christ to sinners. Help us to see that when we engage and remember that when we engage with the lost in this world. And so be exemplary and diligent and devoted ministers of Christ Jesus, our Savior. I ask this in His name, Lord. Amen.